Okay, uh, today we're going to uh, talk about the topic of revealing your business winning ideas with the data science and the testing. Today we have a doctor uh, Dev School here, and uh, he will give you an uh, introduction about this topic. Uh, the Dev School leads the big data innovation at Fair Square Financial LLC, which is a fast growing financial services company based in the US, where he develops data science and the testing uh, strategies for marketing and customer management. He was an analytics consultant at Applied Predictive Technologies, advising data science and analytics teams at several Fortune 500 companies in uh, multiple industry, including uh, telecommunications, retail, and uh, pharmaceuticals. He got a PhD from Princeton University in collective behavior and decision making and holds a degree in both computer science and biochemistry. Okay, I will give the screen to uh, Dr. Devsko and uh, enjoy the webinar. Okay, thank you very much. Let me um, share my screen right now just so you can see my uh, slides. I hope you guys can see all of yeah. this. Yeah, I agree. Great. Fantastic. Uh, great. Well, thank you for so much for that introduction, William, and welcome everyone to this webinar. I'm very excited to have all of you here and to be speaking with you about uh, what's a very fundamental topic about using data to improve businesses. Um, a bit about uh, a bit about myself. I've been I'm really fundamentally interested in how we can use technology and data to learn more about the world around us, which is what brought me first to my PhD, where I studied uh, using essentially big data to look at the behavior of groups and collectives, and then I moved to industry, where I've since worked with many companies to help develop their analytics and testing strategies, and now. I work at a fast growing startup um, where we try to leverage all sorts of data and, and new data sets to uh, understand our customers better and provide them with better products. So I wanted to motivate this talk of revealing your business's winning ideas with data science and testing uh, with, perhaps we can start with a cautionary tale. Um, and that's in particular how to do this poorly and have bad results uh, because of that. So let's look at J.C. Penney. Uh, J.C. Penney did, didn't die in 2013, uh, but the time frame of 2010 to 2013 uh, will tell us is essentially in, instrumental in understanding how testing can be used for or, or not be used for a company's success. So from 2006 to 2010, J.C. Penney uh, faced uh, plummeting sales and had to essentially carry out drastic changes to try to turn this around in, in kind of a panicked state. And this included changes such as changing their brand and the core customers that they reached out to, changing their marketing completely, the entire marketing strategy, changing their pricing completely, what type of products they, they had, things like that. Um, and they, they did all these changes, which could have been great, but all the changes were carried out without any testing. Um, and what happened is essentially the sales continued to drop. The CEO was replaced. And actually not only did the sales continue to drop, to drop but because they invested so heavily in ideas that were not even tested, um, they actually were never able to recover from those previous investments. And you might've seen very recently in the news uh, back in May, J.C. Penney filed for bankruptcy, and that's something that still is ongoing right now, settling all of that out. So this is really a cautionary tale of why we need to do testing to understand um, how our big ideas impact our businesses and how we can leverage data more effectively. So let's look at the opposite end. What is a modern successful company from a data perspective? Well, we can all know about the, the big tech companies of Silicon Valley, you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Microsoft, Google, all these companies, um, besides being in Silicon Valley, share another thing in common, which is that they have testing built into their DNA. 
they view they have a heavy emphasis on testing on making data driven decisions and on iterating and improving very quickly and this isn't just a tech or industry specific thing uh, in many other industries leaders have formed around this very similar principle of harnessing the power of testing effectively to understand their business better you have capital one finance for instance in in financial services you have costco you have Harris entertainment you know you might not think target is a uh, big data and, and innovative type of company uh, you just think when we don't usually think of that when we think of retail but target is one of the the key examples of how to use data effectively to gain insights about your customers including for instance how to figure out you know if someone is pregnant before the rest of their family knows even um, and testing is so fundamental and essential to these companies, and they vouch by it so strongly that when Forrester actually interviewed uh, and surveyed these companies back in 2006, 100% of the companies that used A-B testing said was effective or very effective. So 100% is, uh, I think, all we need to, to, to know from that to understand how people have understood how testing can transform their business. Um, and in fact, if you look at, say, Caesar's Palace, owned by Harris Entertainment, uh, testing is so fundamental and essential to their business that there are really only three things that you can do there uh, that will get you fired instantly. Theft, sexual harassment, and running an experiment without a control. So testing is used by a lot of very successful companies today. And the question is, why do you want to do testing? Well, launching a new idea can be expensive, and you need to figure out what will work. But you don't want to go all in on an idea that is unproven. So testing is a way for you to uh, essentially have a scientific uh, low stakes approach to determine if the idea actually will be worth the investment. And this helps a business essentially map its way through the dark in developing an effective business strategy. Uh, and as David Kelly, the founder of IDEO had said, this method of enlightened trial and error will actually outperform the planning of, or flawless execution or like some brilliant design uh, that was just, you just decide to run with. Trial and error is really the way to, to succeed in business and in innovation. And I'd like to talk this, about this a bit from a, a metaphorical perspective, let's consider life on earth, right? Is it that you know, life was all made from the start by God um, and you know, there was, it was just this brilliant design that, was, that, we, that you know, God came up with and we, we made all of life everywhere exactly as it should be. Um, but what we found out from evolutionary biology, which is what I've studied in my PhD, is that life really hasn't been about you have a perfect design and then it just starts going like that. Instead, nature always tests many different varieties and iterates over uh, these, these variations to try to find the ideal type. So if you consider these butterflies that are different shadings, you, know, you don't know exactly which butterfly will succeed and you know, go on to produce the next generation because you don't know, say, what type of landscapes are favorable. Maybe the darker, darker butterflies are better Perhaps the, the, the intermediate shades are better. And this variation and side-by-side -side testing is really what nature does uh, to produce and evolve life. And it's what's created the diversity of landscape around us today, uh, uh, the diversity of biology, of biology around us today. So given how important testing is to understanding um, our businesses and how to develop a business strategy. What makes a good test? There are really um, five essential questions that we can think about testing in terms of the what, why, the how, and the who, and the when that you really need to answer as a business in order to harness testing effectively. And thankfully, there's a framework that was developed over 100 years ago by William Seeley Gossett, who was one of the founding people of uh, statistics um, and really you could say he's one of the first industrial data scientists in any sense of the world uh, of the word um, and he actually created this framework the the a b test which is still with us today and is fundamental to developing uh, an effective business strategy 
And this helps us answer these five different questions. So if we go through them one by one, um, and we can use an example of, let's say, a new scenario that we're in right now where testing is important. Right now in the news, a lot, a lot of people are wondering about remote learning in school and you know, how can you make remote learning for children more effective? And we can actually use the principle and process of A-B testing to figure this out. Um, so let's say that we, we have a change that we want to make, which is we want to make more effective remote learning. And we think one way to do this is to toggle whether students uh, can speak and they're unmuted or they cannot speak and they're muted during the class lecture. So we have this vision of something that we want to try to improve uh, uh, and improve on an existing version. Um, and then what do you want to make? Why do you want to make this change? Like, obviously, we want schools to be more effective. We think students will learn more effectively, uh, maybe in some environments or versus others. Um, and we need a metric to measure that. So in the case of education, maybe this is the average student score uh, after being uh, taught in a certain type of environment. And the question is, how will you determine whether this is successful? Well, we need some statistically significant uh, improvement. Obviously, not changes are usually not free to make. So for instance, if the school wanted to have all the students with their audio enabled, maybe it needs to pay for a better internet connection. It wants to figure out if this is worth it. And in order for it to be worth it, it needs a certain percent improvement in student outcomes to call it a success. And then from that, you can then choose, well, how am I going to split the subjects of my test, be it students, classrooms, individual schools, into uh, either the test or the control group, the muted or the unmuted groups. Um, and then uh, we essentially measure the performance of these groups side by side over time. And finally, we have to decide when are we done with this test? When do we find out uh, that we have actually enough data that we need to make a call. And maybe let's say we find that unmuted versions of, of a classroom are actually more effective than muted versions because the average student test scores are higher there than in the alternative. So all these questions can be answered by the, the, the A-B test framework that William Seeley Gossett laid out for us over a century ago. So let's take these questions one by one in a bit more detail. Let's talk about what change do you want to make? And this is um, really the most um, personalized and customized one, which really depends on the business that you're running. So test, the key point here is if you're doing testing as a business, uh, you want your tests to be part of a cohesive annual business strategy uh, where the tests are building into something that you want to uh, essentially run more efficiently uh, in your business or you want to reach a certain goal faster. So you can start from your objectives and your key results and then you can see which one uh, is, will be impacted by the test. Another question that we need to ask is, is the idea that you plan to test even testable? There are many ideas that, for instance, cannot be tested. In the age of coronavirus now, People are wondering, when is it safe to get back to work? Or how can we tell uh, how we can get back to work safely? But a return to office, if I'm an employer, is not an idea that I can really test very effectively. I can't put two different groups in two different offices and then see which one has fewer people getting sick. Uh, similarly, there are uh, mar things like marketing campaigns that are advertised nationally, like a Super Bowl ad campaign, which you can run, but it, you don't really have a control group to measure against. So there are many ideas that you, you, you might have, and only some of them might actually be uh, testable ideas. But let's assume now that you have a testable idea. So how do we want to choose the success metric to determine if this idea is a good one or not? What goal do I actually want to achieve through this test? Um, and Really, the key here is that you want to pick one metric that represents your goal and your business objectives uh, that you're trying to improve in this test, uh, and pick that from the start of the from the start of the, the test 
You don't want to pick it once the analysis has already begun. And this is actually a very crucial decision because when you optimize different metrics, you will get different results. So for instance, if you, if you take our classroom example, we can think of many different metrics that might represent better student outcomes. If we want to think about the percent attendance rate of students to class, if we want to look at the average final exam score, or maybe just the percent of people who actually passed the class. All these metrics, if we try to optimize on them, could produce different outcomes. And we need to be careful to understand how could uh, a variation in the way that I run my business or my school or anything um, reach the outcomes in a metric sense that I want, but actually uh, produce it in a way that maybe I don't want. So this, this takes a lot of thought. Now we talked about the school type of metrics, but there are actually a lot of metrics, as you're aware of, in the business world. Uh, from things like revenue and profit to customers, registration, subscribers, clicks, you know, time metrics, all these metrics, um, and there's many permutations like clicks per customer. And choosing the right metric is one of the most essential decisions that you can make in testing so that you are really optimizing the most meaningful things for your business. I'll actually give an example here of a, a business that was optimizing on the wrong thing and thereby got the wrong result. If we consider Providian Financial, it was a US credit card issuer based in San Francisco at the time, and they were focused on the subprime lending area. Now, Providian had all the hallmarks of what looked like a great uh, up and coming company. It was the San Francisco based tech like company. Uh, there were a lot of very talented people there with a strong modeling and testing mindset. Uh, and they really thought that they had nailed mathematically uh, how to make their business work. And what they did was that they decided that uh, profit was going to be the guiding uh, North Star of their business. And they were looking especially at profit in kind of the typical booming economy that they were facing at the time uh, that they were really ascending as a business. Uh, in fact, they, they didn't really pay any attention to things like stress or uh, how many people, for instance, were defaulting on their loans because in their philosophy, they thought, well, if you just price in all that risk into profit and you have the right profit model, then it, nothing can really go wrong. You, you'll keep making money even if some people are defaulting on their loans. But here's just a very minor tweak. They were thinking about profit in a typical economy. If they had, for instance, thought about targeting their testing strategy and business around the a new metric, a very subtly changed metric like stressed profit. How would the business do in the case of a recession or a financial downturn? They might have effect, uh, affected uh, their ultimate fate, which was that really when a recession finally came, uh, the losses ended up outstripping the profits uh, and the entire company basically folded. So a very minor tweak in what you optimize as a business can have dramatic impacts, which is why this question is essential to a testing strategy. Now that you have your idea that's testable and you have a metric that you think reflects the business goals that you want to approve with this idea, how do you determine if the idea is uh, successful or not? Well, to do that, you need to have some way to differentiate the performance between your test and control groups, called a test statistic. Uh, and this is a diff typically the difference between your two treatment groups, or perhaps a difference in ratios or things like that. Um, and really what you're doing here is that um, you, you, you essentially have this measure of, of, the, of the difference between the groups, and then you can ask, by how much do I need this test statistic to, to change or, or be different from a, a, a business as usual case uh, to call the test successful. This is usually, for instance, a break even point on the investment in the idea. Let's say you need $100,000 to test this idea, and then you want it to at least make it that much money, if not more, in return. Um, but knowing the, how, how much of an improvement is needed to declare the test of a, a success, then lets you do something like a power analysis to figure out how big of a test do I need to make. Um, so, this really gives you a sense of what is the signal that I'm looking for and 
how do I need to design the test to reliably read that signal? So we can, when we think about um, this test statistic, let's say we're running our two groups, uh, in this case, our two different classrooms in school, where one of them is muted and the other one is unmuted. And then we look at the test statistic, which let's say we chose the percent of students who uh, ended up passing the, the course. And then we find 70% passed uh, in the unmuted group and 80% passed in the muted group. The question then is, well, could this have simply occurred by chance or is this actually a real effect that we can measure reliably? And we can compare the difference between the two groups that we have to what's essentially a null distribution using randomization and simulation to understand really what is the typical distribution of differences that you might get just by random chance. If you assume that the two treatment groups were exactly the same in how they perform, just randomly you'd expect some differences around uh, zero. And the question is, is the difference that we're observing uh, reasonably captured within that distribution or is it uh, unusually large? And this is really where we get at with this idea of the p-value and the, 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 the te looking at the p-value of your test statistic, which again goes back to William Seeley Gossett. Uh, and here what we can look at essentially with the p-value is it tells us if I ran this experiment a hundred times and I assumed that the treatment that I was giving or the new variation was actually doing nothing, how often would I expect to see a difference at least as big as the one that I'm actually seeing? And this p-value, if it's less than 0.05, is, we typically assume this to mean that it's statistically significant uh, and that therefore we think that the test is actually doing something and we can reject this idea that it's doing nothing. The p-value, of course, can be adjusted depending on how confident uh, you want to be that this actually works. So for instance, you can set this threshold from 0.05 to 0.01. If you want to be really sure of something that say maybe takes a great deal of investment, you want to be really sure that it actually is producing significant results for your business. Now, I mentioned a bit about how picking a metric should be done before the analysis even begins. Um, and there's a reason for this, which is that if you pick the metric after you've already started the analysis, uh, you're going to run into many different issues and it'll, be, it'll create a very tempting scenario to essentially uh, keep prodding and dredging the data to try to find uh, something that is statistically significant, uh, which is often called uh, p-hacking. So this is the idea that you know, you, you, maybe you don't find that the test as it was designed and what you wanted it to measure was not a statistically significant difference. Um, but then you say, well, the business leader and the owner of the idea comes to you and says, well, what if we try a different metric? Or what if we exclude these outliers? Or what if we look at the subset of individuals? Um, and there's a big motivation usually to do this uh, from a business sense, because many business leaders stake their reputations on the value of their experience and their idea to come up with ideas that will work. Uh, so this essentially um, runs the conflict with our motivation as data scientists to really report on what is the truth regarding the ideas, have they improved the business, and being honest and objective about the data. So if we consider, for instance, that we start to look at different metrics after the analysis has already started, and if we consider that, say, a p-value of less than 0.05 means a significant difference, well, if I look at 20 things, I'd expect at least one of them to be significant by chance on average. Um, and then we can we basically end up in this case where we're starting to look for different sort of correlations and spurious correlations that don't actually have anything causal to do with our test. Um, and you know, if you give me a million different metrics, I'll certainly find a couple of them that are highly correlated, even if they make no sense, such as the letters in, uh, of a winning word in a national spelling bee correlated against the number of people killed by venomous spiders. 
And we really need to think about the way that we conduct analyses in the sense that every time we run a statistical test, every time that we run a comparison, we're essentially rolling this dice. Uh, and this dice basically uh, could just by chance, by randomness, land uh, in a place that we find a statistically significant outcome, but it's not actually a real effect. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with exploring the data. Uh, I mean, I do it all the time, and I, I don't think you, you don't want to waste data when you've spent all this effort collecting it. Um, but if, you've are ha if you have a finding that wasn't part of the original test, at the very least, you should run a test again, specifically on that finding. Otherwise, you risk, again, this, um, this chance of finding something purely by randomness and then being fooled by randomness into believing that it's real, to use the words of Nassim Taleb. So we've picked our metric. We know how we can determine if the test was successful. But now, how do I choose the subjects for my test? Here we come again to an important principle for any business to keep in mind, which is that you really need to run tests in a clean way using test subjects that aren't affected by other ongoing tests at the same time. Typically this is done by keeping a pool of clean uh, customers or users uh, that we then picked from for our test. So for instance, in the case of our school, we have our pool of students and we've picked them out for this test where half of the online learners have muted microphones and the other half the control or that's the control have muted and the other half the test group have uh, unmuted microphones. But now as a school maybe I'm the principal or the superintendent and I think we should actually try out different ideas and maybe one of them can be do we send people physical books or do we let them learn through say a Kindle device uh, or through an ebook. And both of these tests, we expect we're doing this to try to improve student outcomes. Uh, but if we were to just take individuals from the first test and put them also in the second test, we greatly complicate our analysis and actually risk making our conclusions uh, be misleading. So for instance, if having a Kindle uh, is worse for learning, um, but a lot of those people are overrepresented in the muted group, maybe we'll get a, an outcome that's actually not informing us whether muted versus unmuted makes any sense, um, that makes any difference. So uh, we always have to keep in mind what tests are still running, are still running and when we can put uh, different test subjects back into this clean pool from which we can draw for our next test. And this is why we really need a central and coordinated testing strategy as a business. It's absolutely critical in order to get reliable data uh, and be able to read reliable results. The other big issue that we need to think about when we design a test is what is the right unit of testing? Uh, so for instance, um, what do we mean by unit of testing? This is really that fundamental uh, unit that you either put in the test group or the control group when you're running your test. Um, and this actually takes a fair bit of thought because what you're trying to do by picking this unit of testing is you're trying to get uh, ensure independence between the test and control groups, but you also want to get good sample size. And these are often in conflict with each other. For instance, if we look at Uber and Uber wants to create a new matchmaking algorithm between riders and drivers, what is the unit of the test that they should use? Should they do individual user sessions, like I log into Uber and maybe I get one algorithm one day, another algorithm another? Or should they choose drivers and each driver gets assigned to a different algorithm as part of the test? Or maybe it's driver, rider, pairs that get assigned. Or maybe they look at individual geographies, like the San Francisco Bay Area uses one algorithm and New York City uses another. This is an important question because it will help you uh, get a clean read on your test. If you choose, for instance, the wrong unit of your test. So for instance, let's say in our school case, uh, we have students that are both muted and unmuted uh, in the same classroom where the unmuted individual is shown here in orange. When the unmuted students might end up talking, they distract the muted students, they engage them in different ways. And now we can no longer get a clean comparison between 
how would students learn uh, if they were in a fully muted classroom versus an unmuted classroom? And this is very important, especially if we look at social network companies or any places where there could be social interactions among users in your test and control group. Of course, we want to have uh, more fine-grained units if we can, such as even individual user sessions, uh, because this will increase the sample size that we have and will make it easier for us to measure an effect but we have to keep in mind this spillover bias that could occur by making things too granular. The question I'm often asked actually when it comes to designing the test and especially when I start talking about control groups is that we're often in situations where we cannot select uh, a proper test and control group. Um, there are cases where essentially your test group is individuals who have interacted with something that was available from your company or your business, uh, and you're trying to basically get a control group to compare to this group. But this group could have a lot of self-selection bias. So as an example, if we think of schools and we look at, say, students that are in a physics course, uh, we might see that they're all doing very well in math. And we think, wow, this, this physics course is really great at teaching math. But maybe what's happening is that the students that are very good at math are also more likely to take a physics course. Similarly, in a business context, if you're a bank and you create a mobile app for your users to use on their cell phones, uh, you might think, wow, our mobile app is really driving stronger engagement and retention. People love using this app and stay with us longer. But maybe what's happening is just your most loyal customers are also the ones that are more likely to use the app. So how can we get over this bias and try to get a cleaner read on how this uh, part of our business is impacting the performance of the business? Unfortunately here, um, this is not really a solved science. There are many uh, possible solutions that have been proposed, um, but it still is uh, in, in need of more thought and innovation. And really a group like Ideas, where we can all gather are places where we can work to develop solutions to these problems. Uh, but there are still some options that have been tried before and have been recommended. Uh, and I would say that they are our best bet at the current time. One thing you can do, for instance, is you can look at your test group, uh, say people who are using your mobile app, and you can look at a few different key attributes, such as say their income or their FICO scores or um, you know, how many uh, bank accounts do they have. Um, and then you can look at what they're at, what they, how the test group looks like on those attributes and essentially pare down or select a control group that looks similar on those key attributes. Of course, when you do this, you end up losing a lot of data. A lot of individuals in the control group will look nothing like the test group. Uh, and the more attributes that you try to match on, the harder it will be to have any control group left after a while. An alternative, is the propensity model approach, which is essentially doing a logistic regression where you're trying to predict, given the certain customers or users' attributes, how likely were they to have been into the, in the test group, essentially. Uh, and then when you score all of your customers on this probability that they were in the test, you can then match uh, your test group individuals to control group individuals that have similar scores and thereby try to get uh, a more accurate reading. Again, it's not a soft science, but there are some tools out there to help us in these cases. And this brings us really to our final question, which is uh, how will we decide or when do we decide if the test was successful or not? And this is one where again, we as data scientists uh, often run into friction with business leaders. Um, because from a business perspective, a test is really a, a very expensive thing to do. Uh, if you're doing a test, first there's the cost of actually running the test itself and having people monitor it and report on it. But then there's just the fundamental cost of, I have two different versions and ideally one of them is worse than the other and I want to get rid of that one. So I want to figure out how to get rid of that one as quickly as possible and choose my winning idea. And this idea of trying to make this decision as quickly as possible 
is a big mistake to do uh, as a business. Many businesses often just run a test and they let the data start coming in, you know, one customer at a time, until they see the first signs that there was a statistically significant outcome. And then they say, that's it, we've got it, we make the choice. But if we actually just run some simulations, we see that this is a, a very dangerous and wrong approach to just keep looking at a test and waiting for that statistically significant moment. Uh, for instance, if we run a uh, kind of a fake test, what's called an AA test, where we have two groups that we've labeled uh, and they have identical treatments and then we run a thousand versions of these tests, uh, what we find is actually more than half of these tests will at one point in time, often very early, uh, show a statistically significant outcome. Um, and this of course is nonsense because we know the test is exactly identical. So this shows the dangers of trying to read a test too early uh, and make a decision too early. Again, as in the previous case, there is no magic number here. There is no magic rule. People often talk, oh, you need 100 different conversions or you need X many impressions, but really math doesn't work with some magic number like that. Um, but the basic rule of thumb that you can think of is that you should try to test longer than you expect. And really you should use this idea of a power analysis and thinking about the effect size that you're trying to read um, and how much sample size is needed. Deciding that up front and then waiting to get that amount of data in before you even look at the test and make a call. Otherwise, you risk yourself uh, falling into these different traps here, like having randomness drive your thinking or you know, having novelty be essentially driving the results that then go away uh, after some period of time. You know, we might get pushback in the sense that people will say, well, time is money. So the longer this runs, the more money I'm spending on this test. But if you stop early, you're wasting both time and money. Testing really to be successful needs a lot of discipline and a lot of patience to let results bake. Uh, before you, you make a call. You, know, you want to avoid looking at the cookies while they're being baked. And the reason is not only because you're wasting your time if you're looking too early, the cookies don't bake any faster because you're watching them, um, but also because from a fundamental part of human psychology, looking at tests too often and too early actually only increases the risk of making gut decisions before enough data have been gathered. And here really there's some very fundamental studies by uh, Daniel Kahneman from Princeton, a, a Nobel Prize winning economist, who knows that, say, if we look at uh, how we value losses versus gains, uh, we really emotionally weigh losses much more than gains. So if we put ourselves in a vulnerable position where we look at a test before it's really decisive and we start to maybe see a trend that, oh, the test looks like it's not working, we might take a gut reaction to cancel the test before it's really had a chance to prove itself. So really that's to say we need to have the discipline to let a test run its course. Still, if you want to make an early decision, there are systematic and mathematical ways to do this, which applies in really a, a, a few special conditions if they're met, but you can still do it. Uh, and this is called the multi-armed bandit approach. Again, it needs some very specific conditions. You need customers to be arriving sequentially, and you need them to be able you need to be able to assign them dynamically to either a treatment or a control group as they arrive. Like think of people landing on your homepage of your business. You can show them one version or another uh, as they're coming in. And you need fast feedback. You need to know, given these people uh, are coming in, they're seeing one page or another, you can quickly measure what is working and what is not in terms of say, how long they spend on your site, do they click into say, uh, applying to become your customer, things like that. Um, and essentially what the multi-armed bandit approach does is it's looking at this data as they're coming in and as one version starts to look better than the other, customers start to get biased towards that version. So you might start out maybe splitting your customers 50-50 between the two different versions but the multi arbon bandit uh, algorithm that you use will essentially detect quite early that, hey, it looks like 
version one is performing better than version two, though we can't make a final call, but we can now bias how many people we put into version one to have more people see what looks like the more successful version. And over time, this method and approach will show us what's the winning idea and all your customers will end up funneled in that idea. So to close out uh, our, our thinking on uh, this topic of testing and how it's important, I want to leave essentially with three key points and insights that I hope have proven how valuable testing is for your business. The first is that testing is really fundamental to life on earth and to your business. Testing is what drives uh, all the variation that we see in the world and really helps us identify uh, what are the winning and the losing ideas. In order to really harness the power of testing effectively, we need upfront design and a testing strategy that keeps us honest and prevents us from being fooled by randomness and spurious correlations. We also need the discipline to carry out uh, a good and holistic testing strategy for our business, uh, whereby we can keep tests clean and measurable uh, and ensure that the right subjects are chosen for the tests. And if we can do all of this, then we'll both be able to save both time and money by running more effective tests and building out the best version of our business faster. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for uh, your attention and for uh, your curiosity on the topic of testing and how it can be used in your business. And I'd like to open it up for questions, if there are any. Okay, uh, great. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, we still have time here, and we also have some questions here for you. Mm, okay, let's go through these questions first. How can Target figure out those personal things about customers? What data and how are they using it? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of this information is proprietary, uh, but you can, for instance, look at um, how people are buying products. Um, I think the first thing that we really need to understand is that data gives us a sense of empathy into our customers and understanding uh, where they are in their lives and, and what they're doing. Um, so as an example for Target, because they're a retailer, they can often tell what people are buying. So I can see when people start buying, say, diapers for the first time. And at the same time, I can see what they were maybe buying three months before they were buying diapers. And in that way, maybe I can uh, look at a new individual who starts to match the same purchasing behavior of people who eventually ended up buying, say, diapers and baby supplies. Uh, and I can look at what, and I can see whether their behavior matches that group and thereby create uh, essentially a predictive model that tells me whether this person is likely to uh, say be at a certain stage in their lives, like expecting a new baby. Okay, uh, we have another question here. It is pretty hard to know if you pick the right metric. Is it that we can only know for sure when the company either uh, falls or succeeds? Picking the right metric is definitely a, a very difficult challenge. Um, I think the key thing that we want to uh, understand, um, of course, when we look at hindsight, it, hindsight is always twenty twenty. And had uh, say Providian succeeded as a company, we might we might think that they chose actually the right metric and it worked out. And in fact, people uh, have kind of wondered and questioned. For instance, Providian had failed but a very similar company, Capital One, that worked in a very similar space and had a similar value proposition, both to its customers and to investors as being this data-driven, testing-heavy company. Uh, both of them are very similar, and yet Capital One is still around. So if we think about a metric, um, again, this is something that's very, uh, I would say, um, I, I think essentially what you need to consider is what are the ways that this metric that you're choosing can be achieved? Um, and are there ways that this can be achieved that are not 
uh, aligned with the business outcomes that you want. So as an example, let's say that um, I am running YouTube and the key metric that I want to drive is how long people spend uh, watching YouTube. Well, if I'm just optimizing this one metric, and I think this is the ideal metric, there are many ways that this metric could be improving, but not in a way that's actually useful for my company. Like maybe people forget YouTube, you know, in a state of playing videos on my computer when I've gone for a walk or something, and now it looks like this person is watching hundreds of hours of, of uh, many hours of YouTube, but actually they're not really engaging with the content or any way like that. Um, so really you have to think very carefully about what is the North Star of your business? What is the way that you would know that your business has succeeded? Like if this metric is doing well, uh, I think that my business uh, it will definitely do well. What are ways that maybe I'm fooling myself with this metric or ways that this metric could look like it's succeeding, but actually my business is not as healthy or doing as well as I'm, 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 uh, I've, I've thought it through. Uh, and are there other metrics or perhaps uh, metrics that we can add in addition uh, to, again, evaluate the health of our business? I think, you know, when it comes to testing, also on the topic of metrics, uh, Providian's uh, kind of issue, and this is my opinion, is that they were really focusing on one metric. They really focused on profitability um, from what was the analysis. Again, by their own acknowledgement, they didn't care about risk, how many people were defaulting. And if you start to really focus only on one metric as a business, then you're not developing as a healthy company. Um, but we shouldn't take that to mean that because as a business, I care about many metrics, then every test, I have to look at many metrics as well. You, you should design tests in a way that I'm improving one or at most a few metrics at a time. And really, I'm trying to reduce the possibility that uh, I'm basically dredging that data to try to find success where there is none from a test. So to summarize, as a business, you have to look holistically at many metrics, but in a test, it's useful to target each test to improving a specific KPI. Okay, uh, we have next question. It seems pretty uh, complex to go through the testing process. How do we know that we choose the right subjects for the various testings? How do we choose a clean pool and how do we assign subjects to the other pools? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so I'm gonna start backwards. Uh, the way to, to think about clean pools is um, you really want to, uh, it, this is really where having a centralized uh, testing strategy comes in, that you want to uh, basically keep a pool of customers who you have not tested on recently. And by drawing from that pool, you are basically almost guaranteed to have a, a clean result. Sometimes though, the effect of a test might be long lasting. So for instance, maybe I sent an email to a customer three months ago and they still remember it and now uh, they're less responsive to another email or initiative that I sent to them. Um, you can always analyze the impact of a previous, say, promotion or test on your customers um, in, in a statistical way. Like you can look at whether that's an important factor in, say, uh, regression on performance or things like that. Um, the other question, uh, William, could you just repeat the, the rest of the question? Okay, uh, we have two more questions here. Um, oh, you, you mean uh, that question or? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just want to make sure I get it. The, the other, um, there was a second part to that question. Oh, the second part is how do we choose uh, the clean pool and uh, how do we assign subjects to the other pools? Okay, I meant the first part then. What was the first uh, part of okay. the question? Uh, about the testing process, how do we know that we choose the right subjects for the various testings? Yeah, so I think you need to, this is again where you need to look at your business and understand uh, what are the mechanisms uh, that really affect 
the behavior of your customers. So as an example, let's take the, the case of Netflix. Um, Netflix, one of their big uh, goals is to recommend the right shows for you to watch. Uh, and maybe the way that they measure the success of their recommendation engine is when you log in and you see things, um, you click on something and you keep watching it. Well, you could, for instance, um, apply this recommendation engine maybe at individual customers and you know, have the same customer, the same subscriber, get recommendations from the same engine every time. Uh, or you could do it at every time that someone logs in. Like I log in once, I get recommended from this model uh, that gives me certain feeds, like maybe action movies, um, and maybe um, I log in a second time the next day, and now I'm getting a different recommendation system. And now I'm actually part of both test and control, but in different sessions. The question is really, is there a way that my behavior or the behavior of someone in your test group uh, could impact their the behavior of someone, including themselves, when they're later in the control group? So in the case of Netflix, if in one session uh, I start, I, I get the recommendation, the engine A, and then I'm like, oh, I really like this movie, and then I watch it, and then the second session I get the different recommendation engine, and maybe it's telling me, hey, you should watch the sequel to this movie that you watched before. Well, now this is no longer really an independent test because uh, I've basically uh, biased the outcome of the other group with the actions of, say, the, the control or the test group opposite to it. So really you have to think about how are ways that customers can interact with each other um, and uh, essentially um, design the unit of testing to control for that. Okay, great. Uh, we have two more simple questions here. Uh, how long is long enough for the A-B testing? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think the key to, to think of, this is really depends on the idea that you are trying to test. Um, I think one, Again, I go back to my rule of thumb that you want to test longer than uh, you typically expect to, 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 try to, te to try to test something. Um, and especially if there's not really a, a cost uh, substantial to the testing. So um, as an example, in my business, uh, we often think in terms of testing on the order of, of many months because there are many... Uh, long-term effects of a certain test that are hard to judge uh, at the start. So in my business, we, we work in consumer lending, and credit cards and finance, and typically people don't you know, sign up for a new product and then instantly like, default or you know, give up on, on their loan or things like that. So we have to try to observe this over a long period of time and therefore tests take a long time to run to, to run through and understand. Um, in other cases, the metric that I'm looking at uh, really is much more uh, short term. Maybe I want to try a different um, format for an email that I'm sending to a customer. And really I expect this email to only affect whether the customer actually clicks a link. Um, and in that case, I can, I can think in terms of, well, how long will it take for us to get um, but basically I've given the customer a reasonable amount of time to have clicked that link, like maybe a week, two weeks, um, and then we can finally run a reliable measurement. Some other rules of thumb are typically to at least have your test last a week because different days of the week uh, will bring in different customers. Um, and some will say you want to have it last for a business cycle, like maybe a quarter, uh, and enough to wear off, say, some novelty effect of the test. So 90 days is also a very good uh, rule of thumb that I've seen. Okay, uh, the last question here. How can we deal with the subjective factor in making more objective decisions regarding the visions we choose without bias? How can we deal? Could, could you just repeat that question again? Dylan? How can we deal with this subjective factor in making more objective decisions regarding the visions we choose without the bias. 
regarding the visions we choose without bias. Um, uh, so I, I think the, the, the key way that we want to, um, to understand this is we, when we're making a, a choice, uh, we really just, we, we have to kind of understand our failability as people and as humans. And, you know, as Daniel Kahneman pointed out, uh, as of our psychology, and we want to try to limit the possibility that we uh, will give in to these biases of our own and uh, basically make a decision that's not data driven. And the principle really that is used to ensure that is to do the planning and decision making up front uh, at a time when you don't know what the data will look like uh, and you don't, uh, and essentially you, you, you can't, you, you set your criteria and what you're going to look at up front at that time. Well, if you do that, um, then essentially you, you have to be objective when you follow through because you've already said, I'm going to look at these metrics after this amount of time with this much sample size. And I have a statistically significant way uh, and, and a well-rounded mathematical way to make all these decisions. Like I can use a power analysis. Uh, I can understand, say for instance, with what level of confidence I want to reject the null hypothesis and thereby figure out the sample size. Um, so, and I can also even decide what are the types of statistical tests and the, that, that I want to run uh, when I am doing um, my, my, my business test. So the long story short is you want to test things, uh, you, you want to make these decisions up front before the data are coming in uh, and before you even know what the data look like so that you can basically constrain yourself to being objective when it's time to actually do the reading and decision making. Okay, great. That's the, all the questions we have today. Uh, Dr. Jefferson, thank you so much for your time. I think your content is meaningful and helpful for all kinds of business. Uh, that's great. And I will send you another invitation to speak in October at our ideas, uh, the Global AI Conference. I believe your uh, presentation will help all the audience to know more about the data science and uh, the uh, relation and in the business. Okay, uh, it's time here and thank you so much for your time and thank you all the attendees to join us today. We'll meet you everyone uh, next week. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye now. Bye.